Okay, let's jump right into the text. Um, remember, this is the night before Jesus is to die. This is literally a couple of hours before he's going to be arrested. He's spending time with his disciples. They are very, uh, they are very upset. Their whole world, they feel like, is coming to an end. Uh, their lives have been turned upside down. And now what Jesus is going to do is he's going to give them a few anchors to hold on to uh, after he's gone so that they can make it through the hard times and do what he's called them to do. Here's reality. Reality is you don't have to be alive very long to know you're going to go through adversity. Amen? You're just going to go through adversity. It can be many, many different things. Most of the adversity in my life, I'm not talking about your life, maybe this isn't true for you, but most of the adversity in my life is the result of my own foolish choices. I've made some really stupid decisions in my life that have caused me a lot of pain and suffering, and unfortunately pain and suffering to those around me. Anybody relate to that? That is the source of much of our pain. Second, we can also have experienced pain by people around us who make bad choices. And the closer you are, to a person, the more their bad choices affect you, right? So my buddy Drew here, if Drew makes a really bad decision, it's going to make me very sad, and I'm going to pray for him and hug him and then send him home. If my wife makes a bad decision, it's going to affect me a whole lot more than Drew's bad decision, right? Because she's living right there in the house with me, and she and I are connected heart to heart. So her bad decisions affect me more. My children's bad decisions affect me more than my good buddy Drew. Right? So the closer you are in relationship, the more the decisions affect one another. Now, I've talked to you many times before about when we walk in relationship with one another, it's like tying a rope around our ankles. And we kind of go through life together. And then sometimes when we start making bad decisions, we start yanking on that rope, trying to go a different direction. Correct? And part of what fellowship is and part of what accountability is, is that rope, hopefully, is bringing the people in my life back onto the road as we're all trying to go uh, the, the direction we need to go in Jesus Christ together. Every once in a while, you have somebody in your life that says, you know what, I'm not going that way anymore. I'm just going to jump off a cliff. And occasionally when they jump off a cliff, because you're tied to them relationally through a rope, you have to cut the rope or you go off the cliff with them. You understand what I'm talking about? And so when you're in relationship with other people, their decisions can really, really affect you. And you have to determine how much pain you're willing to go through. And sometimes you have to cut that rope. Not often, but sometimes you have to. Okay. Number three, there's just living in a fallen world. You end up having pain, right? The world system is, is ruled by Satan. And when Satan is ruling the world and we're living in that world, we can be adversely affected by things that are going on in the world around us just because we're living in a fallen world, correct? And, and we can think of all sorts of examples of how, how that could happen. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one. What happened economically in 08, 09, and 10, right? Were any of you affected by that adversely? <laughs> Absolutely. That's just part of living in a world where we had a government making some pretty bad decisions and we all got to pay for that. Right, and then number four is acts of God um, can cause you pain and suffering. My mother, three weeks ago now, fell and broke her hip. That's caused us a little bit of pain and suffering, but nothing compared to next Tuesday when she comes home to live with us for a month. <laughs> right. I was I was meeting with I was meeting with the, the lady that's it's in charge of discharge, and she says now. Occupational and physical therapy is coming in two to three days a week for about an hour at a time to continue her therapy. Other than that, you're responsible for round-the-clock care. She never needs to be out of your side. And I said, well, I work and my wife works, so tell me what I'm supposed to do. Well, you just go out and hire a caregiver. And I laughed and said, with what? <laughs> what do you mean to hire this caregiver with? So here's reality. I told this last year. Here's reality. I'm going to sit my mother on the couch. I'm going to tell her, don't use the bathroom until I get home. And then I'm going to go work, and then I'm going to come home three hours later and take her to the bathroom. That's going to, that's going to cause some change in our lives, right? Car wrecks. Motorcycle wrecks. <laughs> Things that just happen sometimes. The hurricane in North Carolina. I promise you there's some families in pain and suffering today because of the act of God. Right? There's just things that happen. When we live in a fallen world, are we going to experience pain and suffering? 
Yes. Is anyone exempt? No. But here's what you have to know. In the midst of pain and suffering, you know what we always want from God? Answers. And you know what he always gives us back? Anchors. Mm. We want answers. He gives anchors. We're going to show, I'm going to show you four anchors today. Out of this you ready? Chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. Jesus says, in just a little while I will be gone and you won't see me anymore. Then just a little while after that you'll see me again. The disciples ask each other, what does he mean when he says, you won't see me and then you will see me? And what does he mean when he says, I'm going to the Father? And what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand. They understand he's about to leave, but they don't understand any of the details. What are they wanting here? Answers, Answers right? I want an answer, God. Give me an answer to what's going on. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus realized they wanted to ask him, so he said, are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said in just a little while I will be gone and you won't see me anymore. Then just a little while after that you will see me again. And of course they're nodding their heads going, yeah, that's exactly what we want to know. He says, truly you will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy when you see me again. It will be like a woman experiencing the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives place to joy because she has brought a new person into the world. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. Now, did Jesus answer their question? No. no. <laughs> he, he didn't answer their question again. He just, he just gave more commentary on what he had said the first time. But here's what we know about Jesus in the midst of all this because he's shown it all through his ministry and specifically on this night. When we are in pain, like the disciples are in pain, you know what we can know? You know an anchor we can hold on to? Jesus cares about us. Do you believe that? If you're gonna make it through pain and suffering, you have to believe the truth that Jesus cares about us. It was interesting yesterday in my group, I had a guy ask, he says, how do I know Jesus cares about me? He said, sometimes I don't feel like Jesus cares about me. So how do I know? What's the answer? Because the Bible tells you so. Do you believe this is true? Does this Bible tell us Jesus cares about us? Then what do we know in times of pain and suffering? Jesus cares about us. Now, we know for these disciples, what's he talking about? He's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection. He's saying, look, I'm about to leave and something's about to happen and the world's going to rejoice and you're going to be very sorrowful. Now, fast forward 24 hours, Jesus is dead, and they're in an upper room scared to death. You talk, that's where their pain really hits, right? And Jesus is nowhere to be found. He said, but then in a little while, three days later, you're going to see me again, and the world's going to be upset. Was the Roman government scared to death when Jesus was raised from the dead? Absolutely. And he said, what you're going to receive is a joy, and that joy, nobody's going to be able to steal that joy from you. Now, we know from the disciples moving forward, the rest of their lives were filled with turmoil and pain and suffering. Did they ever lose that joy? They didn't. They did not lose that joy. It went on and on and on. They, it, the world could not steal that joy from them, correct? So, here's what Jesus says. In the midst of your pain and suffering, here's what you can know. You can know I care about you, and because I care about you, I'm always going to be looking for your best interest. Your best interest. I'll always have your best interest at heart. I will be working on your behalf. Now, do we always understand how he's working on our behalf? No. That's the answer part that we never get. But what do we know? We know by faith that he is. So, let me give you a couple of illustrations. The first illustration is Jesus' illustration, which is beautiful. He says, listen, you have to understand that God has a purpose in your suffering. Suffering is like childbirth. A woman goes through unbelievable pain and suffering, but at the end she gives birth to that baby and that baby's being held in her arms. Does she care about the pain and suffering anymore? Because there's something so beautiful on the other side of the pain and suffering that the pain and suffering was worth it for the baby she holds in her arms. That's like pain and suffering in the kingdom of God. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is, is so unbelievably beautiful because in his death, 
there was great pain and suffering, but in his resurrection is new life. And he says, that is what everything in your world is about. It's a series of death, burial, and resurrections. So you know what pain and suffering is used for by God? To kill something in us. He wants a death in us. I need to die to a sin that I've been committing, and he's putting me through pain and suffering, so I'll die to the sin so I can have a resurrection in him. Or die to my pride, or, or die to my selfishness, or die to a relationship. Something needs to die in me, and pain and suffering is what gets that to die so I can have a baby and hold a baby in my arms. And the resurrection is always worth the death. Did you get that? The resurrection is always worth the death, just like the baby is always worth the pain and suffering. We had two kids. I, you know, we don't understand that the way women do, but, but my wife had two kids. I was in there both times. And I mean, I don't know for sure she was in pain, but she acted like she was in pain, <laughs> right? So I assumed she was. But you know what happened? Sarah was born and she's holding Sarah in her arms and she didn't care about the pain. Three years later, we're pregnant again. I'm like, don't you remember what you went through last time? She doesn't care about the pain of that childbirth because the resurrection, because the new birth is worth the pain. Jesus says, that's what you have to understand about adversity in life. I'm molding you. I'm strengthening you. I'm building your character. I'm giving you a resurrection on the other side of the pain that is so beautiful that you're going to look back and go, every ounce of pain was worth it for what I got. You believe that? Every ounce of pain was worth it for what I got. So he said, you have to know that by faith that I care for you, that I'm working in you, I'm working for your good, and you need to know that as you walk through pain and suffering because Satan is going to be telling you, God doesn't love you anymore, God's punishing you, God's hurting you, where's your God now, God doesn't care about you, you have to ignore the voice of the evil one and hold on to the truth of Scripture. God cares. He's up to something. He's molding something in you that's going to be beautiful. Here's the problem. Most men I know, they want a resurrection without a death. Oh, I want the resurrection. I want the baby. I want the joy. I want the contentment. I want what you're doing in me. I want the greatness that you promised me. I just don't want to have to die to get it. So can I have that and still hold on to my sin that I like to coddle over here? Can I do that without giving up my pride? Can I do that without suffering? And what's the answer? No. 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 you got to man up and go through the suffering. you got to man up and deal with what God's trying to deal with in your heart. Then you get the resurrection. The American church is filled with people who are trying to get a resurrection without a death. And I'm telling you guys, quit fighting it die to self and trust that the baby's going to make the pain worth it okay so we're going to stop right here we've got some some uh questions up on the screen we got questions for you around the table uh chat about these for a few minutes and we'll come back and look at the second one The first anchor we hold on to is he cares about us, right? Second one is joy. We serve a God who listens, and he says that's what gives you joy. We can know in the midst of pain and suffering that God is listening to us. So not only does he care about us, he's going to listen to us. Listen to what he says here, beginning in verse 23. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. The truth is you can go directly to the Father and ask Him and He will grant you request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. Right? See how He ties joy in with the asking. Now, you and I both know that God doesn't give us everything we ask for. Correct? Now, what's interesting about this, this very phrase here is he's actually said this three times in this scripture, chapters 13 through 17. He said it in 14, he said it in 15, now he's saying it in 16, where he says, if you'll ask in my name, the Father's going to give it to you. But there's always a caveat, and what's the caveat? The will of God, right? And we saw that in Jesus in the garden, literally 
an hour or two after he says this, he goes to the garden and he says, okay, God, here's what I want. I want to be released from this whole cross thing. I don't think it's a great idea right now. <laughs> and I'd rather have a plan B. But then what does he say? But not my will, but yours be done. He modeled for us. Can we ask for anything we want? And do we ask in the name of Jesus? And if it's in our best interest, will God give it to us every time? If it's in our best interest, will God give it to us every time? Yes. But if it's not in our best interest, God has the freedom to say no. Right? Because it's not my will, but God's being done. Now, I want you to think about this. In Scripture, when Jesus talks about us, He compares us to little children. And that's a very specific Greek word that has to do with two to four-year-olds. It's basically that toddler preschool age. So I just want you to think about three-year-olds. Do three-year-olds have any problem asking their parents what they want? Absolutely not. Do three-year-olds know what's best for them? Absolutely not. How many times do the parents say no to a three-year-old? A whole lot. Now, if my three-year-old asks for something and I can give it to them, will I give it to them? Yes. But most of the time they're asking for things that aren't good for them and I have to say no. Correct? And so I say no. God says that's the same way with me. You're like a bunch of three-year-olds because you can only see about that much of reality. But I see the big picture. And so in the, in the midst of your little world and you're in this little bitty hole and you think you know what's best and you think you know what you want, you ask me, and then you know what I do? I look at that, and if there's any way I can give it to you because it's in your best interest, I'll give it to you every time. But let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you no a lot because you're like a three-year-old. Now, let's tie that into pain and suffering. When my son was three years old, he had to have uh, allergy shots. And to get allergy shots, you have to go through an allergy test. Now, I don't know if you know what an allergy test looks like for a three-year-old, but it's not fun. So here's what happens. The nurse comes in and she says, okay, I want you to hold your son in your lap with his head to your chest. And you're gonna put your hand on his little bottom and you're gonna put your other hand on his head and you're gonna put his arm under your arm and the other arm under your arm and you gotta hold him tight for 20 minutes. 20 minutes. We're gonna put that serum on him and we're gonna poke him with needles and it's gonna hurt and he's gonna scream and you're gonna be strong, Daddy, and you're gonna hold him there because if that serum, if he starts moving around, that serum begins to, uh, to uh, crawl into one another and it gets mixed up, we're gonna to do it again. And you don't wanna do it again, you only wanna do it once. So for 20 minutes, I hold him right there in my lap and he is screaming. Why am I doing that to him? Because I wanna get an injection that will take away those allergies to give him a better quality of life. I see the big picture. What do you think that little three-year-old's thinking? What a horrible, mean dad. What are you doing to me to let some stranger just cause pain in my life? Okay, now remember what he compares us to? Three-year-olds. You know what happens when we hurt? We scream. Why is God doing this to me? Why is God allowing this? Why is God just letting Satan just have his way with me? How many of us, when we're going through adversity, goes, boy, I know God's up to something. I know God's sought something. He's got a resurrection on the end of this one. I wonder what I need to die to. No, we're screaming. <laughs> we're like the three-year-old, right? <laughs> we're going, what in the world are you doing, God? God says, I am a God who listens. Because here's what you have to know. I'm listening and I'm caring, but I'm always doing what's best for you. And sometimes that's not what you think is best for you. And sometimes you're asking for things I can't grant you because I know it's not best for you. One more illustration. We'll go back around the tables and we'll get some questions up on the screen for you to discuss. I want to talk to you about money. Here's a, here's a prayer I hear guys pray all the time. Lord, give me more money. Lord, give me success. Lord, give, give me more. I need more. Lord, if you'd just give me more money, I wouldn't have these problems. We're all praying for, for money. And in fact, we have churches that build theologies that say, if you're faithful enough, God will give you money. Okay, let's talk about what we know about Scripture for, about money. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It, in fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Why? Because money has a tendency to make us think we're dependent upon ourselves instead of dependent upon God. 
Now let me ask you a question. What does God want for us more than anything else in life? To be close to Him, right? To be transformed into the image of Son, to look like Jesus. So anytime I ask for something that could pull me away from God, do you think God's going to grant me that? Absolutely not. No, I'm not telling you not to pray for money. I'm just telling you there might be a reason he's not answering yes to that prayer. Because what God knows is your heart. He knows what's going to draw you close and he knows what can pull you away. And I've prayed to God so many times. I can't tell you how many businesses I've invested in that's going to make me a millionaire. And you know what? Every one of them flop. And I don't know for sure why other than maybe I'm just a bad picker of stocks or picker of businesses. That might be possible. I'll tell you something else that could be possible. I don't know because I've never had money. It could be that God goes, Brad, if you had money, you'd get prideful and you'd start thinking it was all about you and you'd start thinking that you have all this money and you don't need me anymore. And so I got to keep you solidly middle class to keep you dependent on me. Could it be that some of our prayers that we think would be so good for us aren't near as good for us as we might think? Who knows us better than us? God. Do you believe He cares about you? Do you believe He's listening to you when you're coming to Him as a three-year-old asking for things that aren't good for you? Yeah, He's listening. And do you think He loves you enough to tell you no? He always does what's in your best interest. And the problem isn't God. The problem is we have the perspective of a three-year-old. Okay? Let's go back around the table with a couple questions. They'll come up on the screen. Let's talk for a few minutes, and we'll come back and go to the third one. Number three, the third anchor that we have uh, in adversity is that we serve a God who loves. You believe that? He absolutely loves us. Look what it says beginning in verse uh, 25. I have spoken of these matters in parables, but the time will come when you will not, it will not be necessary and I will tell you plainly all about the Father. Then you will ask in my name. I am not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf. Listen to this. For the Father himself loves you dearly because you love me and believe that I came from God. Yes, I came from the Father into the world and I will leave the world and return to the Father. I want you to focus in on that phrase, God loves you dearly. Now, if you look in your notes, uh, there's a couple of things here. Number one, no one is ever going to love you more than God loves you. Do you believe that? Now, look what I wrote there. God's love for you is based on His character and not your behavior. Now, that's really hard for us to grasp, okay? Another phrase I put in here is His love for you is not transactional. We have a hard time understanding the love of God because our love for one another is transactional. You do something for me, I do something for you. You love me, I love you back. And then when, well, you're not going to love me anymore, well, then forget it, I'm not going to love you either. And on certain levels, my love for you is based on your actions for me. I, I would have a hard time loving somebody if they continuously treated me poorly. I think I'd probably lose my love for them. Somehow, I don't understand this in my brain, God loves us based on who He is and not who we are. And He loves you because He loves you, not based on how you act or how you live or what you say or what you do. It's mind-blowing. Now, I could, we could go on two hours and talk about that. We've talked about the love of God recently, so that's all I'm going to say about it today. We're going to go back around the tables, but if you'll notice the question I want you to answer is, is this one right here. How would you describe the love of God to a non-believer? How would you describe the love of God that you know from Scripture to someone that doesn't know Him? So we're going to talk about that for a second, then we'll come back and wrap up. anchor we serve a God who wins we serve a God who wins do you believe that God cares for you do you believe God listens to you 
Do you believe God loves you? Do you believe God in the end, he always wins? And through him, we always win. That's your four anchors you hold on to when adversity comes. Because trust me, Satan is telling you the opposite in your ear the whole time. And you have to overcome that voice and hold on to those four anchors to see, to see through adversity. Okay? So let's talk about this last one. He, he closes out in verse 32 by saying, But the time is coming, in fact it is already here, when you will be scattered, each one of you going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. So he says, you're about to be scattered. Was that literally true? Yeah, within the next two hours, they're all going to be scattered, right? They scattered, they run to the hills, and he's going to be left all alone. But he says, I'm not alone because the Father's with me. But he says, here's what I'm going to give you. You're going to have peace. And then here is the kind of the, the famous quote out of this scripture. He says, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. There's a perspective that happens in the life of a believer when we go through pain and suffering that a non-believer doesn't have. And that perspective is the eternal perspective. We view everything in life from the view, the perspective of heaven, of eternity. What's the worst thing that can happen to you in this world? Give me the worst thing. You die. What happens when you die? You win. So can it really get that bad? It can't get that bad, right? And in the middle of pain and suffering, God is up to something, right? He's creating something in you. He's building your character so you can be a better man of God, so you can have more impact in the world, so you can get old like me, so you can die and go be with Him. No, it just doesn't get that bad. It doesn't get that bad. Even if things are bad, they're not that bad because at the end of it, what do we have? We have a God who wins. Does Satan win? No. God wins. And so we're literally playing a game in which we know which team wins and we get to pick the team we're on. So we win. We win in adversity. We win in life. We win in death. And he says, in the middle of it, are there going to be many trials and sorrows? Yes, but what can you know? I overcame the world. I was resurrected. I'm going to work in you for resurrections. There's going to be a series of resurrections in your life where I'm going to give you incredible things in your life like peace and joy and contentment, those kinds of things, joy, love, all those things that the world wants that they can't find apart from Jesus. He said, I'm going to give those to you in abundance, in abundance, and you, your life is going to win because it's about the transformation of the heart, and I'm going to give you a heart that is a heart after me. And that heart after me, that's life. So living life in this world isn't about escaping pain. Living this life in this world isn't about pursuing pleasure. Living the life in this world is about the constant pursuit of God and what He is doing to transform our hearts to be like Him. And the more we do that, the more peace we have in our heart, the more contentment we have in our heart, the more love we have in our heart, the more joy we have in our heart. And that's what defines the beauty of this life. The beauty of this life is not the car you drive. It's the relationships you have, your capacity to give and receive love from people, the capacity to, to have godly and good relationships, contentment in your heart with what you have. Will you have adversity? Absolutely. And when you walk through it, what do you know? He cares about you. He listens to you. He loves you. He is going to overcome this, and He's going to get you on the other side to what? A beautiful baby. So what's your job in the midst of adversity? You guys remember? To die to what God wants you to die to. A sin, some pride, some selfishness, some ego, whatever it is. Die to it. And trust that on the other side of the adversity is a beautiful resurrection of something greater. Here's what you have to understand. There's something greater on the other side with a resurrection than you ever had on this side. So in other words, whatever you're dying to, as hard as it is, that is less than what he's going to give you in the resurrection. And so you keep dying to things to have something resurrected that's better. Okay? That's it. We're going to, we're going to stop here, go back around the groups, answer the last set of questions, pray for one another. It's about two till eight. We're about out of time. There'll be some questions come up on the screen for you as well. Okay?
God bless you guys. I hope this fed you today. I hope it fed you, gave you some anchors for your adversity.